Good afternoon, dear dentists, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 8th Joint Dental Webinar of the Schools Division Office Quezon City and Schools Division Office Mandaluyong. This webinar is sponsored by Dental Access and Advanced Asian Dental Summit Convention or AADS. To start off, I would like to call in Dr. Joy Baginon, Dentist 2 of STO Quezon City to lead us in prayer. Is Dr. Joy in? Dr. Charlie? Yeah, yeah. Joy? Dr. Baginon? Dr. Joy? Dr. Joy? Hello. Yes, go ahead, Doc. Uh, can you hear me, na Doc? Yes, Doc. Okay. Uh, let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, we praise and thank you for this day. Send us your Holy Spirit to be our guide and give us the wisdom to understand the topic that we are going to discuss today. Enlighten our minds and let your love be upon us. May this webinar bring success and growth to all of us. We thank you, Lord, for this precious time that you have given us. Please bless us all. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Doc Vicky. Thank you, Dr. Joy Baginon. Good morning once again, everyone. Thank you for joining our eighth joint dental webinar of SDO Quezon City and SDO Mandaluyong. As responsible dentists, it is but fitting for us to update ourselves and gain new insights in the dental profession by attending dental webinars, even though we are in this pandemic. Now, to give us the opening, re opening remarks is none other than the hardworking and gorgeous dentist in charge of the Division of Quezon City, the one who initiated this joint dental webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Charlie V. Dominguez. Thank you, Dr. Vicky. I'd like, once again, I'd like to welcome all our dentist participants, particularly our DepEd family, the, our DEDA family. And I would like to welcome, a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Dr. John Cutter, thank you so much for being here. Uh, so this afternoon will be a very enlightening uh, day for us because Dr. Cutter will uh, discuss something about, uh, I think, this pandemic which is uh, happening all around the world. And again, I would like to thank Dental Access Dr. Amy Jesus for making all of these webinars possible. This is our uh, eighth webinar, so we have been we have been having a head webinar for the past eight weeks. Thank you so much, Dr. Amy. So let's start, Dr. Vicky. Thank you so much. Okay, let's start. Thank you, Dr. Charlie, for that very warm welcome. Here are the parameters of the webinar. We encourage you to join as an active participant of today's webinar. We expect proper conduct where participants will listen and mute their microphones while the lecturer is presenting. We also encourage each participant to turn off their cameras to prevent any disturbance with respect to the lecturer and the rest of the participants, and you may do so now. Public participants' questions will be addressed during the public comment period. You may not interrupt the speaker during the lecture. Should you have inquiries or concerns, please message the moderator, which is me, 
And place your comments here at the chat box and the moderator will address your concerns or inquiries. Do not close your session or log out during the webinar to avoid interrupting the system as well as the lecture. You can log out after the event finishes. Don't use the chat room as your personal messenger. We ask all participants to refrain from using the chat room for any other purpose than inquiries related to the lecture. For attendance and certificate purposes, if you are from DepEd, you need to accomplish the feedback and evaluation form to be posted later in the chat box to generate your certificate of attendance. Thank you, and I hope you will learn and enjoy from today's webinar. Today's webinar is entitled Infection Control, the Agony and the Ecstasy. Um, and, to, and to introduce the speaker, a resource speaker is a graduate of Bachelor of Arts and Doctor of Dental Surgery at Ohio State University in 1976. And Professor of Radiology, Pathology, Practice Management, and Current Trends in Modern Dentistry at the National University College of Dentistry, Manila, Philippines, from 2016 to 2019. He developed the first dentistry curriculum in the Philippines for dentistry students in digital e-charting and utilizes the same in community oral health initiatives impacting 3,000 indigent school children and presented these results at the FDI World Dental Congress in Spain in 2017 and Argentina in 2018. He was at Westat, U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention from 2010 to 2014, and the principal dentist for the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey of the CDC. Now, to talk about the topic inf infection control, uh, the agony and the ecstasy, as I mentioned earlier, ladies and gentlemen, please let's, let's all welcome Dr. John Cutter. Thank you, doctor. And uh, good afternoon, doctors all. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, especially to Dental Access and the Advanced Asian Dental Society for this kind invitation. I'm always happy to speak and share my 46 years almost now um, of what I've experienced in dentistry and what we're seeing, especially in the current day with COVID-19. And as I turn on my slide set here for you. Let me see if I can get you to where I am. And can you see my slides? Doctor? Now, Doctor, um, my moderator, can you see our slides? Yes, Doc. Okay, very good. Um, but your but your audio is a bit. Uh, uh, I think it's not audible. Not not so audible. Uh, you need my sound up. All right. Let's see. Um, <laughs> oops. Excuse me. And. How now, doctor? Is that better? My moderator, is that a better sound quality for you? Yes, that's better. Okay, very good. Well, let's get right to it. Um, as was said, the lecture today is called Infection Control, the Agony and the Ecstasy. I have been for the past 20 years, among the other part of the resume that you heard, a certified instructor in infection control for the OSHA um, people in the United States, that's the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And the reason that we're getting into this is because there's so much misinformation out there currently as far as what we need to do for infection control. And before we really get into that, I need to make a, a number of disclaimers. The first is 
all the materials I talk about today, the organizations, the equipment, I have no financial relationship with any of those individuals or companies, nor do I receive any remuneration from any of those groups. And I will say that the other disclaimer is that I should probably apologize up front because no matter how hard I try, I will probably offend someone today. And maybe that's too harsh a word. Um, especially if there are any vendors out there in the audience today, I'll probably end up offending a few of you with what I say. But uh, it's not so much that I'm trying to offend you. That's certainly not my, my intention today. Um, but you'll probably walk away feeling a little angered in some situations because you're going to find out that you've either over-purchased in trying to attempt infection control, or you may realize after we get done with this that you've under-purchased and perhaps your physical space isn't ready yet to start treating patients um, under the bloodborne pathogen. And the other thing you may be asking yourself is, why didn't someone ever teach me this in college or through my organized dental groups? And that's a really good question. And maybe we can go into that at another time. So basically, where shall we go today? This is an 18-week course um, that I developed a number of years back, and we could spend tons of time. But today, what I think I want to do is I want to focus on what you need for infection control. I want you all uh, also to focus on what you don't need in particular. And in the process, we'll discuss some current equipment and engineering information suggested in the popular and professional pre press. And as a result, we're gonna dismiss a number of myths along the way. And as a bonus today, actually two bonuses I have for you, I will reveal the one item that you absolutely need to have today for superior infection control. And I'm going to go through a lot of references and rather than post those to a screen, um, I will post my email address at the end of this lecture and you are more than welcome to reach out to me and I will send you two full pages chalked with references that you can do your own due diligence online um, and through the government sources that I rely upon as well. So let's get back to the, the title. The agony and the ecstasy. Why the ecstasy? Well, um, as the slide meme shows that if the Vatican had painted the Sistine Chapel in today's terms, they would be guilty of not, uh, 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 not abiding by uh, social distancing and may end up get fined by the local uh, police force. But the ecstasy of all this is that there really aren't many changes that we as dentists have to do from the original protocols that we were supposed to have been following all along. We've been through pandemics similar to this before. We were successful, we got through them. We'll be successful and we'll get through this one too. And the other good news is COVID-19, which is our new best friend forever, is relatively an easy organism to destroy. I'll grant you, it's an infectious little booger, but for all intents and purposes, it's not nearly as hardy as say um, tuberculosis, which has a very durable capsule around it. And it's not nearly as long lived as hepatitis B, which can be on a fomite surface for up to a week. Um, and more importantly, the good news is we as dental professionals should really be the royalty of infection control. Um, not only that, but we see more patients annually than any other portion of this healthcare sector, with the exception of pharmacy. Now, why is there an agony to all this? Well, it's because a number of you probably haven't been following the standards and protocols all along, nor were you ever informed. And then, too, there was a ton of misinformation, as I've already uh, apply, uh, implied. And there's also the cost. And I'm not going to go into the cost of infection control, but if we get time at the end of things in the Q&A, uh, somebody remind me of the cost that we endured during the post-HIV mandates. And the other thing that's going to happen is you're going to find out that the new world will also include litigation. Um, malpractice is right around the corner. Not only do you know what the standard is now, but the patients 
know what the standard is and the public is becoming aware of it. And the only dentist to his credit that I heard reference this on the local news was Dr. Steve Almonte, um, who was the previous president of the PDA. And he was the only one to voice that concern for practicing dentists across the Philippines. And he's absolutely right. Um, we haven't had malpractice insurance as a need here in the Philippines for quite some time. But believe me, especially once the universalization of the PhilHealth law takes in full effect, I would say between 12 and 24 months after that, you will need a malpractice insurance coverage. And the other thing is that you're probably not following agony-wise the number one rule of infection control as well as practice management, and that rule is don't panic. There's light at the end of this tunnel. But let's get back to not following standard protocols. This is basically what was developed in 1991. This is the Bloodborne Pathogen Standard, and it was developed in a response to the then um, HIV AIDS epidemic that was occurring. It was later revamped in 2001 to tighten up regulations on needle safety. But it should be the prevailing standard, standard operating procedure. It should be our SOP that we deal with, given all the potentially infectious material we encounter daily. And that includes things besides blood, um, like saliva, skin tissue, semen, vaginal secretions, um, any other liquids or materials that happen to be soiled by any of those, including um, potential for coming in contact with vomit or tears or sweat, um, as well as any kind of excreted material or sputum at that point. As my former chief medical officer at NHANES used to say, if you want to encapsulate the uh, bloodborne pathogen standard in a simple um, phrase, it's respect blood. And the next question is, what procedure do we do in dentistry that doesn't involve blood? And the answer is none. Everything we do comes in contact with blood, whether we can see it or whether we can't. And so therefore, we have to be extremely careful of this because it's all about not only our new best friend forever, um, SARS-CoV-2, uh, aka COVID-19, but all those other 500 pathologies that we taught you in dental school that are always with us at that junction. The bloodborne pathogen standard involves itself with three primary areas. And the first is engineering protocols. And this revolves around isolating or eliminating the bloodborne pathogen from the workplace. And that includes matters of sharp disposal containers as well as self-sheathing needle systems and the air quality that we deal with, not only our air systems engineered within our practices, but also dealing with the aerosol generation. Under that rubric also falls work practice controls. And work practice basically is a functionality of making sure that the procedures that we do reduce the risk of exposure by how those tasks are performed. And these in include items like prohibiting manual recapping of needles or our hand hygiene, um, preventing food or open container liquids um, into the office. That's all food in all the office. Let me reinforce that. Those of you who were students of mine knew that at NU I was the absolute food Nazi. We don't bring food or drink into the clinical environment anywhere. Take your staff out to lunch, make sure they go out to lunch. You go out to lunch, but don't bring food into a healthcare facility for the sake of infection control. Um, it also uh, prohibits applying facial cosmetics, um, lipstick, lip balm, putting in contact lenses manually, prohibiting wearing jewelry um, of one form or another while you're in the office. Now, this doesn't apply to your uh, reception staff. They can get away with that. You as the practicing doctor can't at that point. And it also requires utilizing uh, informational signage like we have down below with the uh, food labeling at that point. Let me say something about hand hygiene. 
because this is something that gets short shrift or it tends to be minimized almost to the point that we take it so much for granted. Hand washing, if we abide by simple hand, wise, simple hand washing, 75% of all the known illnesses today, let me say that again, 75% of all the known illnesses today can be eliminated before they start by the simple act of hand washing. That includes 50% of all cases of dysentery, 33% of all respiratory infections. And that's especially critical for us in the Philippines because we stand 27th in the world for respiratory illness related death. And it also prevents 600,000 childhood deaths globally under the age of five. And that's a remarkable statistic because wherever we have gone currently, wherever hand hygiene has been introduced, childhood mortality has gone down. And of course, you should be very familiar with the 11 step WHO method of hand washing. By the way, it's soap. It doesn't need to be antibacterial soap. Um, it doesn't need to be uh, PBS soap. Any bar soap will do, good old fashioned soap at that point. But it's important to know as much how to scrub as to when to scrub. And the 11 steps are outlined. These are the eight core steps and you need to be able to know each of those. And your staff needs to be able to know how to perform them step by step in order to understand and to assure that you have good hand hygiene. And also, by the way, it's hand washing way above hand sanitizing. These are different events. In fact, just this last week, a white paper came out um, from the AMA stating that we're now seeing large cases of skin irritation from individuals who are hand sanitizing so much. Hand sanitizers have limitations. They are not meant to replace hand washing with soap. Um, not only the fact that they can break down because of high alcohol content into the hand sanitizer and water, and the water can basically invite bacterial populations, but also because we're seeing that not all hand sanitizers are created equally. You as a doctor should avoid commercially available hand sanitizers. If you're gonna have it available in between your scrubs, um, then you need a professionally manu manufactured hand sanitizer at that point. Above all, don't try to make your own hand sanitizer. This has been a critical issue with hand washing. And two or three years ago, um, we started teaching students about the advent of a piece of equipment called BioVigil. BioVigil came out in hospitals and is used to test the adequacy of your hand scrub. Um, so basically, once you've washed, you can put your hand over the uh, BioVigil, and if you are properly disinfected by your hand scrubbing, um, then it will glow green. If not, it's time to go back to the sink and re-scrub at that point. The other of the three rubrics is personnel protocols, and this involves principally PPE and vaccinations. And that leads us into the step of universal precautions. And universal precautions is the number one most important method of preventing any occupationally acquired bloodborne disease. Basically, it makes us treat every patient as if they were infected with a bloodborne pathogen. Is that important with the Philippines? You bet it is, because 70% of our population from cradle to grave never goes to a physician. So your histories are pretty much blind events and you need to act accordingly under universal precaution. It also requires our employees to wear some type of PPE to prevent that direct contact with blood or bodily fluids. And as far as the PPE is concerned, it is specific in what it's supposed to do. It must be task appropriate. Not all your staff will wear the same type of PPE. You do not wear street clothes underneath your PPE. You wear your scrubs. Those are your underwear. And you are never removing your PPE from the office. If you're going to decontaminate or you have washable PPE, 
those washing units must be performed on site. So you're keeping your washer and your dryer in your office. Um, if you're open air washing in your office, I would tend to try to dissuade you against that um, because there's too much opportunity for spillage and cross-contamination. But under the bloodborne pathogen standard, those PPE are provided to your employees at no cost to them. And likewise, they are uh, enjoined never to take PPE home. So you're going to walk in off the street from here on out. You're going to go to your changing room. You're going to get out of your street clothes and your street shoes. You're going to get into your scrubs and then into your PPE. And you will change those PPE between each and every patient. And you, if you are an employer or if you're working for an employer, that employer is solely responsible to ensure that the PPE is properly inventoried, cleaned, laundered, repaired and disposed of, again, at no cost to the employee. Vaccinations are equally important under our personnel protocols. Your employees, once they are hired, have a 10-day window. They must start their HBV, their hepatitis B vaccine regimen, um, within that period of time. And again, this is done at no cost to the employee. It's not necessary if the patient has already been vaccinated and they can provide you with a positive immunity uh, statement from an antibody test, or if there's a medical history contraindication to that individual receiving the vaccine. But that's few and far between as far as contraindications. Um, so again, you as an employer must ask yourself, if a patient refuses, or I'm sorry, if an employee refuses vaccination, will you continue to hire them? My answer would be, in the impending days of malpractice to come, your answer is no, you won't. The last rubric of bloodborne pathogen is waste management. And waste management deals with all the so-called regulated waste, basically blood and semi-liquid blood or uh, OPIM, other potentially infectious material, as well as contaminated items that could release pathogens to the environment, as well as other toxic waste like lead, uh, spent processing solutions and mercury. And as of the second of this month in the United States, mercury scavenging of all water lines is now mandatory. And I would suggest that this will become more and more a global compliance issue in very short term. Um, also, when you deal with um, waste management, we're also talking about how we deal with that waste that we dispose of. You've already probably been informed that there are now three color codes for your um, uh, waste baggage that you're using. When it comes to our sharps and our instruments that we're disposing, those have to go into sharp containers. Those are always hard shell, they're leak proof. You never have a uh, sharps container that isn't stored or utilized in an upright position. Um, we never overfill these. We throw these away at about the 75% fill level. You always make sure your employees never reach inside these units. And they come with a snap lock closure so that when you're ready to dispose um, of the unit, you snap the lid closed, you snap that opening port closed, and then you tape it across in an XYZ fashion. Then you put it in a box and you tape and label the box. And then you throw it in a dumpster. And in the United States, um, those dumpsters are regulated. We have to have a medical waste dumpster, and it is only for medical waste. It is not meant for any other kind of disposable. It is locked with a key. You have a key as an employer. The waste management company has a key. And at that junction, that provides the casual dumpster diver or the potential child who might think this is a great play area to get in and become exposed with infectious material and more importantly, sharps. And it also acts as a preventive to issues of drug abuse that are out on the street as well. Um, the PDA interim guide does a really excellent job, I think, um, of identifying how waste management in the Philippines will be handled. And I would refer you back to that document because I think they've done an admirable job of, of um, 
basically trying to uh, eliminate potentials for problems on the street and more importantly, our waste collection people in the Philippines from coming in contact with the issues they don't want to come in contact with. OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, adds two more rubrics to the bloodborne pathogen standard. And the first is employee training. And that involves you as the employer at no cost and during working hours upon hiring or being hired to have that personnel being um, uh, given office manuals, all the necessary government regs and codes and standard guides. Also, you're uh, teaching them how to risk identify as well as a general discussion of bloodborne pathogen like we're having now, and then teach them about their personnel risk prevention with PPE, our workplace controls, vaccinations, how you respond to emergencies, and more importantly, how you will evaluate and respond to post exposures. If an employee or you yourself happen to get a needle stick or a sharps cut, how are you gonna deal with that? And what is your protocol for making sure that you don't become a vectored source for future infection? And then as well as having various labels and signs and colors in use in your practice that are part of the standard protocol. They also require you to have records management, and that's the other one. You must keep training records, basically records of your annual and quarterly training of staff as they come in. You need to keep a Sharps injury log and document the instances and the dispositions of those potential injuries, and you must all keep medical records. Not only records on yourself of your medical history, but all of your employees. And in the States and under bloodborne pathogen standards, take a look at how long you as the professional have to maintain those records. For medical records, you keep the record for the duration of the employee's tenure plus 30 years. In other words, you keep those records forever and they must be made available on demand to the oversight uh, uh, group, whether it be OSHA or some other organization. Training records you can get rid of uh, in three years. You're gonna hold training every year, at least minimum, for your personnel to make sure that they're up to speed on infection control. At the end of three years, you can throw it away and you can start a new um, log. Sharps logs, ditto. Um, that's kept for five years at that point. So that's where all of us were supposed to have been as of December 2019. And then as of December, some people say November, I tend to throw back to the literature and say, we kind of knew about COVID as early as October. We met our new best friend forever, COVID-19, and people went into a dead panic. And that was really surprising, especially professionals. Because in 2015, right up to the president, or president, we had Zika. Ebola was before that in 2014. We had MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, um, which itself was a coronavirus in 2012. H1N1, swine flu, happened in 2009. And by the way, for the people who have been crying wolf saying, especially in the United States, look at the death qualities that, or the death um, uh, levels that are there. Uh, there have been 3 million deaths. Um, and the issue is, oh, I'm sorry, there have been 3 million infections. The issue is, but there were 60 million infections in the United States alone to H1N1. We had uh, SARS, we had the first coronavirus, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome. In 2003, we had HIV AIDS in 1981. In reality, we had it in 1968. We just didn't know what to call it. Uh, we were seeing patients who were wasting away under our hands and we had no idea what they were suffering, suffering from. And if you go back far enough in the literature, you'll find out that we called HIV AIDS autoimmune cachexia. And before that, there was H2N2, that was the Hong Kong flu. And before that, there was the Asian flu in 1957. And in 1918, 1920, there was the Spanish flu. Doctors, in the past 100 years, you are now experiencing the 11th 
pandemic in modern history. We should have been much more resilient and we should have been far less panicked than we were. Yet, a lot of confusion led to misinformation. That misinformation led to more um, panicked speculation. We saw a loss of credibility and belief um, that resulted in virtual nostrums and anecdotes, even by established healthcare professionals in the field that were perverted into protocols and treatment plans, virtually without question or challenge. And soon thereafter, the Philippine Dental Association published its interim guides on infection prevention during COVID-19. And I got to tell you, the six years that I've been here in the Philippines, I think this is the best thing PDA has done in a long, long time. Um, but let's focus on one word in that. Um, and by the way, when I first got it, what did I do with it? Well, I read it uh, page by page. And then I sat down with two colleagues here in the Philippines who know infection control, and we tore it apart word by word. And then if that weren't enough, I sent it off to my collaborators at the CDC in the United States and asked them to do the same thing. And the answer that came back in most cases was, this is a very good interim guide, but it begs a lot of questions that still need to be answered. So let's focus on that word interim at that point, um, because we will continue forward. The pandemic won't go away soon. Um, we will have to live with COVID-19 as part of our playlist of organisms that we deal with, but we'll learn and we'll adapt and we'll continue to edit this document. And it's up to professionals in the field like you to insist that organized dental organizations and governments do that on an annual or semi-annual basis so that we are compliant with the best information at hand. And the PDA interim guide does not replace the bloodborne pathogen standard. It supplements it. So this is our new normal. And this is a dental practice in Manila. Uh, and thank you to the doctor who allowed me to uh, use her photograph. This was what she posted on her website. And then she was kind enough to let me use it in my lectures and it was still kind enough to be my friend because I said, I can count four things that you absolutely positively didn't need to ever buy and still keep your patients safe. And so we're going to talk about that. Um, and within that, the question is, as I promised, what do you need? Well, the first thing you need is you need a good pre-COVID screening protocol. Um, and to that end, there are perfectly good protocols um, through the ADA. The PDA has an acceptable form as well. This is a great time for teledentistry. There's no reason to do those screenings in your office. That can be done at the time the patient makes an appointment. And by the same token, uh, it can be done as soon as they come to the office. But again, the one thing that you do need is a good thermometer. Check their temperature. Temperature, dry cough, and <clears throat> potential um, malaise and tiredness are some of the primary issues. Do not do what you see this young woman doing in um, the street. Don't take your PPE out in the street. All you need is a face mask and a shield and your thermometer, and you'll be fine. But don't take this um, reading while the patient is inside your office. Do that outside. And then if they've um, tested negative on all counts of their pre-screening survey and their temperature, then go ahead and admit them to your office and you can go ahead and get to work. The one thing I would add to your pre-screening uh, survey is the one thing that hasn't been listed but has now recently come out in the literature and that's ask your patients if they've noticed any unusual eruptions on their toes. COVID toe is now a 
bona fide symptom of COVID-19. It's basically an atypical inflammatory vesicular papillary lesion that can ulcerate. And just this past three days, we had literature that came out that said, we're seeing oral lesions finally that seem to be associated. And these can take the appearance of mimicking anything from um, hemorrhagic petechiae, papura ecchymoses to aphthous ulceration, almost mimicking in some severe cases what erythema multiforme looks like. So you might want to include that to your pre-screen forms as well. The other thing you need to be concerned about, of course, is aerosol generation. And the three principal areas where we see aerosol generation in the workplace, in the dental workplace, of course, are your high-speed handpiece, you know, without proper evacuation, that aerosol travels eight feet out and eight feet upward in its distribution. Also the Cavitron or the piezoelectric scaler puts out an, uh, an immense amount of aerosol as do ultrasonic instrument cleaners. Um, and the problem with all of this is that within the aerosol, the COVID virus can exist. We admit that it's bloodborne by definition. If we're generating it in an aerosol, then at that point, it's a bloodborne disease. But you can see in this comparison chart to basically particulate matter, the big black um, globs here on the, on the slide, that compared to particulates or even red blood cells or even the common bacillus, which usually uh, comes in at about a half or 0.5 microns in size, Coronavirus is only about 0.1 microns. The bigger particles can be as much as 0.3 microns, but it's a really small puppy. So if um, the 10 micron particulate is uh, Jupiter, um, coronavirus is an asteroid if Earth is that smaller 2.5 uh, particulate at that point. So we have to be concerned of the fact that this is a very easy particle to transmit. So how do we minimize the aerosols in the office effectively? Well, the first thing you do is you have chair-side assisted high volume evacuation, basically HVE. This will eliminate 95% of your aerosols, but the tip has to be properly placed. It has to be at a right angle to the occlusal plane closest to your operating instrument. If you're working at a different angle, you're pulling the aerosol at a different angle, and you may not be getting as much aerosol decrease as can possibly happen with just simple HVE. Do you have enough horsepower in your office? A two to four horsepower um, pump, evacuation pump, is about all you really need in a single office. That will service uh, up to three to four chairs um, adequately at that point. Um, you can also use an isolate, which you see here. The isolate two is a combination evac with a mouth prop and a light source. This is a wonderful instrument. The only problem with it is it's pricey. So you may want to just relate to the simple HVE tips at that point. And also, you have to keep in mind that if you're going to be using HVE, you're going to have to be requiring proper trap cleaning and flushing of your HVE lines to make sure that you're not getting any residual open inside of that um, passageway. The other thing you can do is you can use a rubber dam. Rubber dam will stop 90% of the potential saliva before it ever gets to you and your handpiece to cause an aerosol at that point. And you can either use a standard frame like you were taught to in school, or you can use something like um, the uh, smile line types of, of uh, rubber dams, which look very, very much like the Optigate um, uh, products that are out there. You can also use a pre-procedural rinse, but um, that will only reduce 65% of bacterial populations on most cases. Will it destroy um, COVID? Well, yeah, yes and no. Um, the issue is about three weeks ago, there was a wonderful little study that came out of Australia where they tested pre-procedural rinses on 700 plus products. They use chlorhexidine, they use mouthwash, essential oils, they use povidone, iodine, and the winner 
The best one was simple sodium hypochlorite, salt water. Um, it's important to know, why do I say, will it destroy um, COVID? Yes, it will. Um, but the no part of that is it's important to note that also there's been research that came out of Australia that's shown that COVID and its virion is resilient in uh, and it's resident in salivary gland endothelium. Therefore, the question you'll probably ask is, well, do we have to break and we have to let the patient rinse every 10 or 15 minutes while we're doing a procedure? And the answer is no. But it does speak to the issue that the patient is probably constantly shedding the virus particle. And those are studies that we still need to perform. And it also talks about the possible development of salivary rapid testing, and that's gaining a lot of traction right now in the professional press. Um, and it also reinforces the fact that you, doctor, as a dental professional, are to be considered as a frontline healthcare resource in this battle. And don't be surprised in the later stages of tracking and testing that you're the primary healthcare professional that governments are going to look to. Um, the other one down in that right-hand corner of the slide is the other way that you can eliminate aerosol and that's cut dry. Don't use a water spray. You can use dry cutting for all cast and icy dust, three, four, and five lesions. If they're small, I promise you, you won't fry the pulp. Um, I know you were taught that. And the question is, why do you believe that? And I'll be happy to explain that to you offline. But those were all um, uh, non-in vivo experiments. Uh, air exhaust from a high-speed handpiece will actually cool the tooth by one to two degrees centigrade all by itself at that point. So you can cut dry and be perfectly, those of you who are pediatric dentists, I know you don't turn on that high speed uh, water for simple pits and class one lesions. You can be in and out faster and the child is much more comfortable than trying to generate heat from that handpiece frictionally. The Cavitron too, do you have to use a Cavitron? No, I particularly don't like this instrument because I don't like the way it, number one, produces so much um, water exhaust. And I don't like the way the handle heats up in my hand. On the other hand, you can use a mechanical scaler, an automatic, uh, an automatic uh, mechanical scaler, like the one shown on the right. This is the Perio Star Titan. And it may take a while to find it on the secondary market, but these are wonderful tools. They're not piezoelectric, they're not um, ultrasonic. They are a mechanical scaler that has a four um, tube insert um, that attaches to your airline. It's a four hole airline. And then it powers a drive shaft around which a cam rotates eccentrically. And that eccentric cam makes the uh, scaling tip vibrate and they are wonderful. Plus the tips are well engineered. You can get into places that you can never get into with a Cavitron. If you don't like any of those options, you can always hand scale. You can pick up your scalers and your hose and your Gracie's and you can do that. But I would suggest that if you do that all day long, you may end up investing in some of these as well. That's a lot of work for you or your hygienist at that point. And last but not least, the other source of aerosol contamination is our ultrasonic cleaner. Ultrasonic cleaners you should be using as a matter of course. You shouldn't be just scrubbing your instruments. Ultrasonic, uh, uh, scrub them first to get rid of the gross material. Throw them in an ultrasonic with your ultrasonic uh, solutions and your primary disinfectants, and then take them out, rinse them, dry them, bag them, and, and sterilize them at that point. But never remove the lid on these units um, and they leak horribly. I will tell you that from a standpoint of generated aerosol, they do leak a lot. And so don't keep them in your patient treatment areas, put them in an isolated area like your laboratory, but nevertheless, never remove the lid unless you are simply putting in instruments or taking them out. All the rest of the time, the lid stays in place, it stays closed. And at that point, you should change by the book, the solutions for every batch of instruments. Do we do that? 
No, our rule of thumb was that we would change as soon as we saw gross particulates floating in the solution. That's not every batch, but it's pretty close to every two to three batches. So maybe you can get a little stretch on your solution, but you need to be very critical about changing that solution and disposing of it properly within your waste protocols at that point. What don't you need? Well, the first thing you don't need is this. These standalone um, extra oral evacuation units gain popularity. Don't ask me how. I have a... I have a suggestion, um, but the problem with not using them is this, and I think this is demonstrated really well in this slide. If you take a look, the farther that distance increases from that cone of the standalone evacuator to the patient, the more potential of allowing that uh, distribution to occur from the aerosol itself. Also, please notice this patient is not properly positioned. Um, she's at a 45, almost 45 degree angle. That's not where you should be treating your patients. And see too that the dentist is trying to use an HVE plus the extra oral vac at the same time. And look toward the right corner of the slide. You see that aerosol escaping from both of those evacuation sources. So the ineffectiveness of these standalone units Plus, in this case, a patient who isn't properly positioned and thereby not allowing a proper position of the HVE tip at 90 degrees to the occlusal table basically allows far too much aerosol scatter to be um, uh, tolerated. And then the other thing with this is basically the cost for one of these you can buy six to 9,000 HVE tips. These standalone units cost between 35 and 50,000 pesos. Um, for that amount of money, you can buy six to 9,000 HVE tips. When I was still in practice back in the United States, I had two practices, my flagship and a satellite. That would have been a five-year supply of HVE tips. So you do the math and tell me which is better. Um, I know, oh, by the way, if you look at page 29 of the PDA interim guide, they cite clearly that there's been no significant efficacy research on these units. And as a result, they leave it to your discretion to use your own best judgment. They don't take a stand and say, really, guys and gals, <clears throat> you don't need this. But in point of fact, no, you don't. Um, why are they catching on so much? I think it plays to your wanting to practice alone. You don't want to have an assistant next to you, or you feel you can't afford to, uh, to hire one, or you feel your physical space is too small. And the issue is, I'll be happy to talk about all of that privately, because that tells me that there are engineering protocols that need to be put into place before you should feel comfortable about treating patients. The one thing that is critical that you do need in all of this is air quality control. You need to control the uh, environmental nature of where you are. And this is your biggest engineering consideration. Um, in my day, we used to call it laminar airflow. It means the air comes from one area as an output, it gets directed in a single direction, it gets sucked up and vented, and then it gets disposed to the outside world. And that was and has been the standard forever and ever and ever. Um, I was just this past Thursday um, in a meeting with the director of uh, Philippine General Hospital, Dr. Legaspi, and I was complimenting him on the fact that when PGH was first identified to be a COVID treatment um, hospital, the first thing Dr. Legaspi and team did was they re-engineered their whole air system, and they put in a unidirectional air system that moves in one direction from clinic to clinic to clinic. It's vented then. Once it's uh, retrieved, to the outside environment. The group that has been responsible for overseeing our air quality um, in the United States and elsewhere is a group called ASHRAI. That's the American Society of 
heating, refrigerating, and air conditioning engineers. And this has been their statement at the beginning of COVID. And pay attention to the red. Airborne exposure to the virus should be controlled. Changes to building operations, including the operations of heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems, can reduce, important word, reduce airborne exposure. And as you heard some malls and some schools and colleges suggest, unconditioned uh, spaces can cause thermal stress to people that may be directly life-threatening and that may also lower resistance to infection. In general, disabling of your air supply is not a recommended measure to reduce the transmission of the virus. In other words, you need airflow. No, you don't need to have your windows open, and that is absolutely prohibited. Um, don't open your uh, windows to the outside air. You should be a closed environment that has proper engineering protocols that create a laminar airflow and abide for air quality at that point. There has been an issue also of questions of do we need air purification systems? And I would, if you ask me, consider it an elective at that point. Um, air purifiers do a perfectly acceptable job of removing particulates and allergens, but those particulates and allergens are pretty meaty size. Um, they're 10 microns and up to um, three microns in size at times. But again, we saw from that previous slide that COVID-19 is a 0.1 micron virus. It doesn't really get hooked up in much of this unless you have multiple HEPA filtration units um, that are serialized within the unit. And HEPA filtration is okay. It's good. It's been found to be most effective when it's placed. And these units in particular, if they're HEPA units, are found to be most effective when they are placed directly above the patient. And again, remember, you're not working with a patient at 45 degrees. You're leaning them back into that semi-Trendelenburg position where the head of the patient is right over your thigh and the patient is staring directly up at the ceiling at a 90 degree angle. And that's where your filtration unit is best placed at that point. Um, and again, if you're looking at these units, look and see what the ultimate filtration unit uh, or the ultimate filtration rate is. Um, and it you can't simply put a HEPA filter into your existing ventilation system uh, without taking into consideration how much air exchange takes place in your space. How fast does that air turn over as a volumetric gas in say a 24 hour period? And then at that point you can find out whether HEPA is uh, reliable or not. Um, and it, what it should not be done or what it should not do is it should never be placed lateral to your chair. It shouldn't be placed next to the chair. It shouldn't be placed behind the chair. It shouldn't be placed at the side of the chair because all you're doing is you're inviting aerosol distribution to be redirected from the sources that you've already taken into account, like your HVE to limit that at that point. Um, also, if you remember that <clears throat> slide on ASHRAE, they said reduce COVID. These units don't eliminate it and they don't kill it at that point. Masks, you need your masks, of course you do. Do masks work? Absolutely, positively, yes. But that then gets us into a question which mask am I gonna use? We've got surgical masks, we've got N95 <clears throat> respirator masks, we've got KN95s that are out there, and we now even have had suggestions that maybe N98 nanofilters are the best masks to use. And if you watched the rebroadcast of Sona here in the Philippines, you saw surprisingly a number of our senators were wearing N98 masks at that point. What mask you don't wear is a valved mask. And this is from Medical City here. Um, 
you can wear a surgical, you can wear an N95, you can wear a KN95, you can even wear a cloth mask in public, but please don't wear any type of valved mask. They are absolutely prohibited. They protect you, but all the effluent from your rebreathing goes directly back into the environment and onto individuals who you might be in contact with, patients or public otherwise. The deep dark secret of masks is that all, uh, masks are like diets, they all work. Um, as long as they are properly fitted and properly sealed, you can invest if you want in a fit test unit, um, or you can basically now 3D print frames to basically help secure your mask if you have questions about its fit. You can also, 3D print neck straps that will help spare your ears and basically seal the mask. If you wanna know on a surgical mask, is my mask well sealed? The question is, <clears throat> first of all, if it's properly placed, does the mask insufflate when you breathe in and out? In other words, is the mask basically inflating and deflating while you're breathing? If it does, chances are very likely it's well sealed at that point, and you don't have to do anything more than that. But if you wanna go the extra step, um, by all means, you can invest in these 3D printed materials. I'll be happy to put you in touch with this dentist who does it. Uh, he was also 3D printing nasal swabs for the government um, when I last talked to him, and uh, doing it at a much lower cost at that point. But you can also see from this slide the best and the worst face coverings. And with the exception of a cotton t-shirt or a silk or a simple bandana, um, everything works. Yes, a valve mask does work, but we never use it in a patient quality setting or even in a public setting because you're just spewing too much particulate onto individuals at that point. While we're talking about masks, we need to talk about the five mistakes that I see professionals and non-professionals alike making. Number one, it has to be properly placed. It has to go from the bridge of your nose to under and beneath your chin. And then it has to be properly sealed. Make sure that it, um, the sides are properly sealed. If you don't want to use a fit guard of some sort, you can double tie the loop. Um, and there are wonderful um, YouTube videos to show you how to simply do that. And it will seal that mask right down against your face at that point. You also only adjust the mask by the ear loop. You never touch the outside of the face mask. If you do, then it's time to throw that mask away and remask. And by the same token, if you get any type of soilage, liquid or otherwise, on the mask, it too needs to be replaced by a new mask. And once you are wearing it properly, realize that you don't touch it. Where you've put it is where it stays at that point. Don't slide the mask down while you're wearing it onto your neck. Why? Even with a face shield, you're going to get some exposure to your neck unless you're wearing a full cowl with your PPE, which is perfectly fine. But then when you re-elevate uh, that mask, all that contamination from your neck is now directly in touch with your mouth and your airway. That junction. What don't you need? Thank you, doctor. I know the doctor whose photo is, is in the audience. You don't need respirators. You don't need a full respirator. You sure don't need the um, oxygen pressure um, cowling that's out there, the passes that are out there at this junction. Um, if you're painting a house, respirators are great. These were designed for chemical occupational safety, um, chemical workers, painters, but you don't need them for what we do on a day-to-day -day basis in dentistry at that point. Um, and it goes from the overly fearful to the absolutely ridiculous. Don't try to make your own mask, please. Um, leave that to professional manufacturers. But that being said, um, keep in mind that not all masks are gifts. It costs anywhere between 98 centavos to a peso 45 to manufacture a mask. Now consider that when you start buying these. It only costs 10 pesos for the flimsy little face shields that are out there in public right now. 
Um, also, I have a huge objection to vendors in the Philippines unparceling their boxes and selling it to you by the stick. Insist on your vendors selling you boxed material. You're going to need to keep inventory now. And at that point, the box gives you an opportunity to inspect where the manufacturer is, when the manufacturing date was, what the expiration date is, and any advice from the manufacturer that may be proportionately applied to these products. Um, absolutely favor manufacturers from Taiwan, South Korea, India, UK, EU, US, Canada, as long as they don't manufacture using a supply chain that came from China or Pakistan. We have had far too many problems with defective material um, and inadequate um, uh, manufactured masks like KN, uh, KN um, 95s. 60, 68 of the 80 manufacturers globally um, showed defects and they all supply chain through China and uh, Pakistan. So be aware of that as well. You do need PPE, by the way. Here's a study by Hinken and Cutter basically back in 2008 where we said what do you need to treat a patient you need gloves you need a gown you need an apron you need a mask we just talked about you need some kind of eyewear goggles are okay bumblebee glasses are better that cover from outer campus to inner campus you need a visor and by the way this was a uh, united kingdom study so when they say visor we're talking face shield a cap would be very nice um, and you need some kind of theater footwear. This was de rigueur. This was your fashion on some if you were going to treat the average patient. What don't you see here? You don't see a lab coat. You don't see a canvas jacket or coat. Um, you don't see scrubs only. And you sure don't see any vi visible street clothes of any sort. So... Does this look minimal to you at this point uh, after all of COVID? Well, you can say, well, that was 2008. You know, we didn't have COVID back then. We'll take a look at the CDC website. This is their recommendation for um, COVID use today. Basically, you see a mask, a face shield. You see a gown that goes below the knees. You see uh, one pair of non-sterile clean gloves, um, and you see basically scrubs underneath. You don't see any booties here. They don't point that out. But this is what the CDC recommends as, and this is for, excuse me, front liners. This isn't just for day-to-day -day operators. This is your day wear at that point. And um, there was at the beginning of all of this, um, very good bundled sets that were available here in the Philippines. We were purchasing these and using them for individuals who said that they were um, low on PPE, and this is a perfectly good set. But what's really necessary in PPE? First of all, it needs to be liquid and permeable. Um, the gown has to be, has to be rear entry. You walk into the gown. You don't button it or close it over the front of you at that point. Um, there need to be two ties. One has to be neck high and the other one needs to be around your waist. And there needs to be an elastic draw or there needs to be some kind of gauze garter at the wrist. And again, rear entry, no zippered, Velcroed or button fronts. Why? Well, the answer is because there's a potential for separation and that can cause uh, contamination and cross infection control problems at that point. So also knowing how to properly put on and take off your PPE is critical. Donning and doffing is essential to knowing how to wear and utilize your PPE. And again, to their credit, page 24 and 25 of the PDA interim guide, does a very good job of showing you the steps of doing it. There are various universities on YouTube that also have demonstrated very, very well the proper uh, procedure for donning and doffing um, PPE, and it must be done in a particular sequence. My only mild criticism of the PDA is PDA doesn't make it known that taking off your PPE is a two-person event. 
you can put it on by yourself, but you need another person to help you take it off. And once you do that, whether it's your assistant or whether it's another doctor in the office who isn't in patient care, um, that probably explains why we had such a high incidence of frontline healthcare workers who died in the Philippines. I really would like to go back and see if those individuals were following strict protocol under PPE. Uh, somewhere it's been nagging me for nine months that that's the reason we lost so many people. Face shields. Face shields are out there by the bundle right now. And the ones that you can buy in SM or off of the street, the little 28 peso um, shields are not for you. You as a provider need a face shield that is made out of polycarbonate, not a flimsy thin piece of plastic. Um, the best ones also provide a secure uh, headband or sweatband. Um, there has to be enough room in that face shield to accommodate either your correctional glasses, your lenses, or if you're a loops wearer, you've got to be able to have those loops on the inside of the shield, not the outside of the shield. Um, and then if you're only wearing eyewear underneath your shield, again, make sure that eyewear has no lateral vents on it. Um, there are any number of laboratory glasses that I've seen sold on the market here in the Metro Manila area that are basically meant for lab wear, but they're not meant for aerosol protection. And they have vented side shields. Those don't, ex those can't be used. And by the same token, the easiest ones um, are a bumblebee glass, that one that basically is a bubble glass that extends from the outer campus to the inner campus of the eye. You can wear goggles. It's not necessary, they're hot, but if, if you feel more comfortable, go ahead, that's fine at that point. Booties, I think booties are a great um, uh, must as well because these particulates tend to be heavy and they tend to uh, saturate out fairly quickly. And there is now a manufacturer who makes a little booty machine. You can put a whole package of booties in there and all you have to do is step in. It'll snap the booty onto one foot, then the other, and then you walk away without ever having to touch and possibly break sterile at that point. Let's talk a little bit about gloves. Most gloves today are manufactured almost 95% of the gloves globally are manufactured in Malaysia and every year they've gotten um, thinner and thinner and thinner. Um, and I will tell you from experience that in every box of gloves, you will find about 10% that are defective. So keep that in mind. Why is that important? It's important because you're going to go back to your vendor and you're going to renegotiate a price. And you're going to say, why am I spending full price for a box of gloves where 10% are defective? Time to make me a deal. And, and I think you're perfectly within your rights. And here, because of uh, the dexterity people, I think they put some things on their box that are very important for you to pay attention to. First of all, these gloves are powder-free and they're nitrile at that point. They are single wash, or I'm sorry, they're single use only. Do not wash your gloves. As a practitioner in Cebu, uh, early in the COVID pandemic mentioned to the media, it's, oh yeah, we're short on gloves, but it's okay, we're washing them up to five times before we need to change them. The answer is no, 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 you don't do this. They are meant to be disposable. They're powder and latex free because we're trying to prevent allergy potential, not only to you, but also to your patients. Many patients have latex allergies, and for that reason, you need to use a latex free, uh, free glove. My preference is that the glove also be beaded at the wrist. This creates a very positive seal. And also notice that the glove is meant to be worn over your gown, not under the sleeve of your gown. So it's meant to basically capture your wrist underneath the glove. And your surgical gloves and your exam gloves are never to be used when you're handling instruments post-op or um, getting them ready for sterilization and cleaning at that point. For that, you need a pair of heavy nitrile gloves, similar to what you would use for simply washing um, um, your dishes at home. 
What don't you need? Well, unless you're working in a high volume COVID positive uh, environment, you don't need the snow bunny suit or uh, as I refer to them, the Teletubby suits. Um, these are fine uh, if you're using multiple layers. Hopefully these um, staff members also have PPE under this unit because again, they have zippered fronts. Um, but these are hazmat uniforms that you within your private practice really don't need to invest in at that point. And if you're still feeling somewhat insecure, if you feel like um, you're um, not protected enough or your patients are not protected enough, look at our friends down at the Oncohema Ward of the Cancer Institute at PGH. When they reached out to me and um, our rotary group here in Manila, they were asking for PPE. And I said, not a problem. Would you like me to come in and suggest? And they said, well, we already have a wish list. This was their wish list. You're seeing nothing more than the bloodborne pathogen standard from 2008. Bouffant, mask, face shield, gloves, disposable PPE, waist high, scrubs, and booties. And believe me, their patient population is so much more fragile than yours will ever be. If they feel secure and I feel secure for them, you should feel secure and your patient should feel secure as well. We need to talk a little bit about the musts of disinfection. I'm going to assume that you all know the difference between a sepsis and disinfection and sterilization. And also the fact that you know the difference between critical and semi-critical and, and non-critical instrumentation. But from here on out, if you haven't been doing it already, your critical and your semi-critical instruments must be steam, heat, and pressure sterilized. That includes all of your hand pieces, your high speed and your slow speed hand pieces, make sure they're sterilizable. Um, if you prefer, you can go to a cassette operation using a statum. Um, and those are excellent machines from a management standpoint, instead of a 25 to 30 minute kill inside of an autoclave canister, this is a six minute kill from beginning of uh, process to end. Also, pay attention. Your instruments are, be, are to be cleaned and bagged, taped, and labeled before they go in. And you need a date of labeling so you know just how long that um, instrument has been inside a baggie at that point. And like I said before, you're going to need to keep a sterilization log. I have this on your reference sheets. If you email me, I will send you in those references a link you can go there you can download this to your heart's content and not have to worry about printing um, or xeroxing a bunch of these as well and you should be weekly spore testing because the issue is how do you know you're sterilizing and you won't know that without a spore test uh, some people do it more frequently we in our offices when i was practicing did it once every week and basically these are um, microbiological units that basically come in a little ampule. You break the ampule, you put it in a dry block sterilizer, and 24 hours later, you've got an answer. If it doesn't color change, you've got a problem. Your last batch just didn't run, or the instruments from the last week didn't run and run sterile at that point. So please invest with these. If you're, if you're using reusable masks, uh, again, the recommendation on N95s is you shouldn't use them more than five times, but they aren't sterilized unless you take some, I'm sorry, they're not disinfected, unless you're taking some precautions. There is a study that came out last month from the University of California in San Francisco, and they swear that if you take a glass beaker and you fill it with 60 ml of water and put some gauze over it and rubber band it and put your mask on top of it and then run your simple microwave um, for three minutes on high, it completely sterilizes the mask. Yes, I know there's metal on the mask. Will it damage the microwave? UCSF says, nope, they haven't had any problems with it, even though there's sometimes a little minimal sparking. Mayasawa won't let me do it at home to try to find out if it really works. But I recommend that to you because it's an option at that point. Um, Disinfection is, is, and the materials that we use for disinfection for our fomite surfaces, surfaces is 
critical at that point. All of our semi-critical semi instruments, which aren't heat sterilizable, need to have some kind of high level disinfectant. The Champion is glutaraldehyde. It comes in the market label of Cytex, Cytex Plus. Um, a gallon of this will last you at least a week, uh, maybe two if you're lucky. You can use it for your burrs as a, um, um, the euphemism is cold sterile. It's not sterilization, it's disinfection. Or you can use it in a caddy for your instruments that aren't um, uh, heat um, uh, or th that aren't heat critical or, or able to be uh, heat sterilized. Again, this isn't sterilization, this isn't disinfection, and a wipe won't do it. Your instruments need to be fully submerged in this for a minimum of 15 minutes and then wash, dried, and repacked at that point. Um, low level surface disinfection for all other issues. Um, again, the best one that's out there is good old fashioned ethyl alcohol or isopropyl alcohol. But take a look, 70 to 90%. Now keep in mind, I don't know if it was the same for you when you were in school, but when I was in school, I was given a gallon of 90% um, ethyl alcohol. And that's what we used for our surface disinfection. That's perfectly good. COVID won't um, stand up under 70% ethyl or isopropyl alcohol. But again, these are only for your low level disinfection of surface areas and any equipment. The easiest thing to do is pick up a phenolic like Lysol or Clorox disinfecting wipes. The problem that people have is that people don't know how to disinfect with low level. And the scenario is basically wipe the area, okay? Take a clean, dry towel, wipe it dry, wipe a second time and let it air dry. How long does that take? It depends on the wet kill rate that's listed on this side of your container. And you have to be beholden to that. I will tell you that that's only gonna take about eight to 10 minutes tops. Usually it's closer to six at that point. There are plenty of FDA, EPA certified disinfection, uh, disinfectants for surfaces. And here's the deep dark secret. Since the 1980s and the Reagan administration, the FDA and the EPA no longer self tests. They farm all that out to other organizations. When you get an FDA uh, uh, certification on your material, it tells you that it has lived up to the certification standards of other products that they have uh, registered. There is one product out there that we have found does kill the vast majority of bio burden. Um, and that is a group called BioSurf. It's a product called BioSurf. It comes in sprays and wipes, and this will destroy um, 95, 98% of the organism. Problem is it's manufactured in Canada. If you can get a hold of it, just fine. If not, Lysol wipes, um, Clorox wipes will do just fine at that point. Um, or you can bag your chair. There are polyethylene bags that can be used. Um, you can do the same for your headrests. Um, and that's simple. Anything that is bagged, light handles, doesn't have to be wiped down. Did we in practice? Yeah, we did, just to wear a belt with our suspenders. But nevertheless, this is one more item that you can use to help go through or help eliminate a more expensive surface disinfectant. Um, otherwise, again, if you're using cling wrap, you may be like our friend from the don't panic slide. Uh, cling wrap is perfectly good. It's a pain to take off. It's easy to put on. Sometimes it's not easy to put on, um, but it's a pain to take off. I would rather bag something, or if I can't bag it, I just simply surface disinfect. Because there are so many sinkers um, with aerosols compared to floaters, again, your floor is probably one of the grubbiest areas in your office or your clinic. These Sanistride maps are important. I like them because they're one inch deep. You can put your disinfecting solution in there. The patient walks across it as they cross into your clinic. I would suggest having one more and put it in high traffic areas by your 
um, operatories where traffic coalesces. So they hit this twice or three times as they go in and out of your practice at that point. Um, what you don't need in terms of disinfection is fogging. And that's come up recently. At first you saw, especially from our friends in Taiwan, you saw outside fogging. And you've even seen it here in the Philippines. Why? Well, because it's volume diluted by the air quality. In a closed clinic, you don't want it. Um, and the other problem is most of these foggers use a peroxide or they use a hypochlorous acid solution or they use a powdered glutaraldehyde. The problem with that is that long-term exposure is a real safety hazard for you, the dentist, and your staff at that point. You may have seen in the press a while back that we lost a physician in Manila uh, because he threw a, a pulmonary embolus after coming in contact with um, foggers. And again, if you look at the PDA interim guide, um, uh, on page 43, they prohibit fogging. And the AMA just recently last week came out and said, patients and staff should not come in contact with fogging. Um, also, by the way, fogging doesn't eliminate bio burden. You don't go in without having wiped everything down with your disinfectant before you fog. Um, so it gives you a false sense of security. You don't need to fog. And my all-time favorite is UV light. Do you need UV light? No. Um, does it sterilize? Categorically, no, it doesn't sterilize. Does it disinfect? Yes and no. Um, in some cases, it will disinfect very nicely. Um, but the problem is there are all sorts of different types of UV light, um, A, B, C, far E, um, and the UV potential depends on the wattage and the output, the shape of the lamp. It's not just about wavelength. You can't take a wand and disinfect. You need 15 minutes of continuous light with UV. Research has not proven efficacy in hospital settings. Sorry, that literature just doesn't exist. Um, and yet, um, I think what this is, is a great piece of subliminal advertising. I think you see UV light, you think bug zappers. Um, you think getting rid of mosquitoes. And <laughs> that's probably a great piece of marketing. It doesn't work. What I absolutely protest is the cylindrical UV light unit that is suggested that it will sterilize your hand pieces. Nothing is farther from the truth. Don't invest in these. Now, I'm, I'm going to hedge my bet and say I'm willing to change my tune, but there's still research being done. And if I had UV, the only place I would put it would be in a sealed container that's proximal to my HEPA filtration on my air unit. Um, but don't believe for a minute that putting one of these in the corner of your office is doing much in the way of disinfection. Your doctors, you've taken physics, you've taken radiology, this is a form of electromagnetic radiation, and you know it behaves uh, according to the inverse square law. Every meter farther away from that light source decreases the potential intensity of that light by the square of the increased distance. So unless this thing's on wheels and it's motorizing around as a robot, it's a piece of equipment that you don't really need to buy at that point. Um, what do you see missing in this picture? This is a, uh, a private practice. It's back in the States. Yes, I grant you. Um, but the one thing that you don't see here is you don't see a light pole. Okay, the, pole, the light is suspended from the ceiling. And more importantly, you don't see a cuspidor. We have had ages to study cuspidors, and we just can't sterilize them and disinfect them well. But my patient's got a spit. What am I going to use? Well, try considering something like a vacuum rinse. Um, vacuum rinse used to be the trade name. Uh, I think it's uh, Butterfly Industries was, was the manufacturer. I think they've gone out of business. And at that junction, um, we see um, 
we see manufacturers who are now making attachments for your HVE that the patient, when they're in proper position, can very easily spit into. And it'll pull as hard as they push. So don't worry about getting saliva and blood all over the place at this point. Also, say goodbye to paper records. You heard me say you can't use a cover glove anymore. And that's because you can't bring your paper records into the treatment area. If you haven't gone digital, now's the time to do so. Um, paper records were a huge source of infection cross-contamination. And I would highly recommend you looking into a digital platform to do your office records your treatment plans, your management. I'll be happy to suggest one that's been very prominent here in the Philippines that I think is the best one out there. And that's uh, dentalcharting.com. Someone in the PDA uh, website also posted this and she said, how will we conduct dental missions post quarantine? And that's a great question. And if you go to Wikipedia, you will find a reference that talks about the low valuation of dental services in the Philippines. And basically the PDA in their journal pointed out that despite the absence of guidelines specific to that of short-term dental missions in the Philippines, a substantial group of Filipinos still get their oral health care services from short-term dental missions. In 2019, a study was done that found that there is a lack of adherence to pre-disinfection practices, as well as underutilization of measurements to the effectiveness of infection control methods and the lack of compliance. And that's the truth. Our days of dental, dental and medical missions are over. Gone will be the days of tent pavilions and taking out and filling and cleaning teeth in the parking lot. Um, we have to do this. Doctors, you have to start educating our professional and government public and the public at large, that now what we need is education, distribution of materials, taking of baseline triages, and then finding ways to put those individuals in contact with durable treatment sources, whether that be clinics or doctors, hospitals or colleges. What we knew is a dental uh, mission is pretty well gone, just like our paper records are at that point. So this is our new normal. I know I'm running you just a couple of minutes late, but our new normal basically is very simple. It's hand washing, it's masking, it's social distancing, testing, tracing, tracking. And even when we do develop a vaccine, which looks like we're possibly going to be able to do before the end of the year, whether or not it will be market ready will be another issue. And we can't allow ourselves to backslide into the way things were before. Um, but keep in mind, you're safe. Your patients are safe. This is a report that just came out of Johns Hopkins the other day. And look at the infection to mortality rate. Um, that's the figure to keep in mind. Don't worry about how many people are becoming infected. How many people are dying from this? And right now, Mexico leads the bunch. The U.S. is down at 2.8% of all infections. Take a look at the Philippines. The Philippines is 1.8%. And as much as I'm critical about DOH's um, statistics, uh, that's still a pretty good number. Again, you're safe. Your patients are safe. You don't have to overbuy. Bonus time. I promised you the one thing that you absolutely positively need um, for superior infection control. And here it is. You see it? The thing that you need most is a dedicated on-site chair-side dental assistant, maybe two. Um, you want more for your buck? Um, basically, hire a, an assistant and hire a hygienist. The hygienist can cross train and be an assistant as well. But the days of working solo have to end. And that's the motivation between the standalone evac units, the UV light sources, the HEPA filtration air units. Vendors know you're afraid and they know you feel like you can't hire an assistant. I promise you, you can. And the issue is 
if there's a silver lining to all of this, it's that your fees will go up because you'll have to start absorbing the cost of this inventory and this overhead. And when they do, your profit margins better start going up and you better start reinvesting that margin into a chair side uh, assistant. She or he is going to be the individual who does your disinfection, who does your sterilization, who does your protocols and your inventories, and they're going to allow you to do what you do best. And that's be a dentist and operate at that point. So while we're talking about assistance, also remember one last thing, please use disposable tips for your triplex. Um, those are huge sources of water contamination. The standard for potable water is less than 500 colony forming units. I'll be happy to tell you about a dental school who I sat in on whose student did a research project for class um, on the water quality of the water in the clinics and the CFU unit was far above 600 CFU. In other words, we were putting water in patient's mouth that wasn't fit to drink, let alone be used in a treatment setting. In my day, that was less than 35 CFU, but since 1968 to now, the water quality uh, legislation has increased to less than 500 and you'll be okay. Oh, sorry for keeping you, but is there a silver lining to all of this? You bet. Dentistry in the Philippines just got catapulted from 1950, literally, to 2000, or 2020. And it tells us that you are an essential element of healthcare. You are a frontline responder. And this little organism that we call COVID-19 will change how we go about our daily practice forever. And I think for the better. You have to take your rightful place as those who know and practice infection control best. You have to be an advocate, doctors, for your government, your profession, and for most importantly, people, the most important people in dentistry, which are our patient family. Um, you have to demand continuing education on this subject annually. It must be a must. Likewise, you have to demand regulatory oversight and enforcement. Are you gonna spend all this money and time and effort to practice by the standard and let colleagues down the street not do it? Will you have the strength of character to turn them over to the PRC and demand they either correct their way or have their license lifted? I hope so. Um, we will end up changing how we collect our practice data, how we manage that for the good of all concern, both epidemiologically and management wise. And we have to be active participants in overseeing public health in our communities. You're no longer a cottage industry dentist. You are part of the real deal. You are a doctor and you're a critical element to healthcare. Do all of this, your patients will be safe, you'll be safe and I promise you, you're gonna be proud that you're a dentist. So with that, let me say um, thank you very much and maraming maraming salamat po. Somewhere in this, I believe, there was that. Uh, you can reach me at jmcutterdds, all small cap at gmail.com. I'm also on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. You can reach me there. If you reach out to me individually, I will send you those references and you can use them to your good health at that point. Any questions? Anybody left? Thank you very much, Doctor. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, Doctor. Can you be safe? Oh no, but you're breaking up. I can hear you, but you're breaking up a little bit. Can you hear me? Doctor, my moderator. Uh, hi, John. Um, hi, 
yeah, just uh, I, I we just want to apologize for the technical um, um, problem that we're having right now with Doctor right. Internet, as you know, in the Philippines. Right. <laughs> it's really right. quite common. Not a problem. Um, well, to take over for a bit while we wait for her to come back. Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. John Cutter, for uh, this very informative webinar. Um, for the uh, questions, um, we will be moving on to the next part of the program, which is the question and answer uh, portion. Great. Yeah, okay. So um, the first question is, uh, uh, what about the commercially produced filtered masks like the brand Philips, if you've heard of it, which claims to provide ventilation to the clinician? It's quite pricey, but would you recommend uh, dental practitioners to use that? Not, uh, not, not if it's pricey. Um, a level three surgical mask is fully appropriate. Now, if you want to use an N95, go right ahead. Um, but nothing above that expense level of an N95. I worked for, and understand where I came from. I graduated in 1976. Um, there was no HIV AIDS. The biggest thing we had to worry about with STDs was gonorrhea and syphilis. Um, there was hepatitis, certainly, but I worked no mask, no gloves, no nothing um, for the first 15 years of my practice. When I did a full-blown surgical for two hours, I would get caked with blood up to the wrists and I'd go, I'd wash, I'd alcohol off and I'd come back and I'd jump right back in. Um, I'm still alive. <laughs> and, and the issue is um, then with the advent of 1991 and the bloodborne pathogen standard, then we all jumped into masks and gloves. And again, if, if I haven't in the first 15 years been spit on with just about everything under the sun, um, I, I, I think you'll be safe. And so you have to balance safety with economy. And that doesn't mean cutting back. That means find what's acceptable. Um, there is a list of qualified disinfectants on OSHA's website. Um, and I believe that I have that on your reference page. Ditto with the ADA and mask acceptability. That slide that I showed you with um, all masks are, are uh, basically all masks work. That's a recent Duke University study. Um, and we're all finding the same thing. You don't have to spend dollar after dollar for mask safety. No. I see. Um, for the next question, uh, it's from Dr. Maria Socorro Victoria Salazar. What kind of mouth rinse do you recommend before any dental procedure? Salt water. That was that test that came out of, that was that study of 700 products that came out of Australia. Salt water is fine. You can make a um, molar solution of um, salt to water and your patient is great. Um, salt water is a wonderful disinfectant. Um, and antibacterial, why? Because you know from your chemistry days, the salt crosses the cell membrane, it pulls water with it. The cell fills with water and then bursts like a water balloon. Killing bugs is killing bugs, um, mm -hmm. whether I do it with fluoride or a laser or an instrument, um, but salt water is fine. And again, remember the COVID virion is resident in salivary gland epithelium, which means our next area of research will be shedding and how active is that particle in shedding? Similar to the shedding studies that we did which with um, uh, genital herpes, HSV2. Um, so that's gonna be uh, standard. But if you're looking for a very simple mouth rinse, mm -hmm. salt water. If your patients don't like the taste of it, put a drop mm -hmm. of um, mint flavoring in it. I see, but then how would the portion be like? Um, it, it, it's the portion has always been a tablespoon of salt to eight ounces of water. So, yeah, okay. that'll, that'll do it. I hope that clears the question of Dr. Salazar. Right. Now, moving on to the next question. Uh, what can you say from, from Dr. Eli Ruth Santos Castro? What can you say about the efficacy of UV disinfection? You know, as I just said, UV disinfection is, is a jury that's still out and way out. It does not sterilize. 
Um, there are problems with the fact that not all UV bulbs are the same because mm. of their shape, their wattage, their output. Um, also, keep in mind that the other reason we don't talk about um, fogging is that UV light disintegrates fogging, um, especially hypochlorous solutions. If you're using hypochlorous acid as a disinfectant, and you were UV lighting as well, mm -hmm. then at that junction, you're, you're decreasing the quality of your hypochlorous acid solution. But we're not fogging anyway, so we don't need, we need to worry about that. UV light is a no. Um, you get your sunburn. There are, three there are three principal types of UV light, UV, A, B, and C. You get UV, A in just the run-of-the-mill electromagnetic distribution. UV, B mm -hmm. is what basically gives you your sunburn at the beach. UVC um, in the range of the, the nanometer spectrum that it was recommended is basically reflective as electromagnetic radiation. Yeah, it's supposed to get sucked up by DNA and RNA. It doesn't do that well. And so would I recommend it? No, I wouldn't. Um, now there are studies being done on far UV light that are not damaging. And by the way, UV light over long periods of time, if you become exposed to it, will lead to potential skin cancers. It will lead to possible eye uh, ailments like cataracts. Yes, um, And so at that point, it's, it's an unnecessary procedure that I think runs too much risk for my, myself, my staff, and my patients at that point. Um, but there's still research being done on far UV light and if it comes out and bears fruit, then I'll come back and I'll, I'll retrench. I'll say, yeah, go ahead, use it. Um, but no, you don't need it for your, a, a good hospital grade, uh, high level disinfectant followed up by your, your semi-criticals and your, your um, low or your non-critical uh, uh, disinfectants are just fine. Uh, again, I know what the, I know what the marketing drive is. You want to set something up and turn it on at night and leave the office and go, okay, I got it covered. But it doesn't yeah. cover everything. And the light doesn't creep into all areas. You need some elbow grease and a wipe. So. Um, but uh, to follow up uh, that question, mm -hmm. uh, what about the, the UV light being um, uh, attached to the ventilation system? That, that I'll buy off on. Um, if, if you have UV anywhere, it should be housed internally to your ventilation system. It should be closest to your HEPA filters. And then at that point, you can use a high level UV that will just scorch you, but it won't do a thing to your ventilation system. Um, so in that case, I'm okay with it. But as far as being something that makes you say, oh, I've done my job and I've disinfected the office, the answer is mm -hmm. no. And again, it's a disinfectant. It's not a sterilant. It doesn't kill everything. And it's not just about COVID-19. It's about all the other little critters that are our buddies out there. So, I see. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to our next question um, from Dr. Maria Teresita Carpio. Most of our government dentists are working alone uh, or without dental aids. If it would be a cumbersome to use HVEs while working alone, would you recommend using acrylic aerosol box? Or no. what no. else would you recommend to ensure safety despite yeah. of lack of dental assistant in the operatory, especially, I'm sorry, the question is long. No, 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 if okay. an emergency treatment creating aerosols would be necessary. Yeah, the first thing I would do is as a group of government dentists, I would approach the government and petition that they come up to speed. Um, and I know I'm being recorded and so be it. The issue is for five years, I've knocked on the door of DOH um, and in one form or another, we've offered assistance. Um, we have urged practices to take a much higher standard of infection control. Again, the days of solo practice are over. And DOA or government or otherwise, especially the government, by the way, boys and girls, the line item budget for oral health, education, and agriculture this year was 9.3 billion pesos. Last year, it was 4.3 billion for just oral health and education alone. 
what are we doing with our money? And uh, the issue is, is well taken. We need to educate our government that there's a way of doing things and we either do it right or we don't do it at all. Um, and I know for a fact that there are only 18 government dentists per million population in the Philippines. You men and women work hard. You, and I've sat in on some of your, your conferences and you guys really, God bless you. You're doing the Lord's work out there under circumstances that a more generous God would have never had given you at that point. But the government sure ain't God and they should be made to listen. And it's time for you to find your friends in government and start bending their ear. In the case of an emergency, I hear you. What are you going to do? Um, I sure wouldn't invest in a standalone unit. Um, the, the issue is you're going to have to do what you have to do. Would I use a box? No. Why? Because it concentrates all the aerosol on the patient. They're saturated when they walk out of your office. Now a patient who is relatively infection-free goes out into a community that you've sent them into covered with their own bio burden. Um, there's no easy answer to that question, and it's a really good answer. And I would love to take a stick to the, to the, the obstacle that has created it, but mm -hmm. we need to talk to our governments, our LGUs, our employers, and say, we need to do this and we need to do it right. Otherwise, we risk the national citizen. And you're an advocate, you're a doctor, you know better. So don't cut corners, don't slide backwards. Um, again, I honestly think you may look back on COVID-19 days and say, this was the best thing that ever happened to Philippines dentistry. Too much? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's it's a it's really very very um, uh, informative, Dr. Cutter. Um, now, um, I think this question is from Dr. Rose Nobley. Uh, what about care in the mobile buses? Will that be okay? There is a protocol that is now available. They've already they've already taken this into consideration. There is a protocol that is uh, is available to evaluate mobile dental units and it's a very good protocol and it can be used um, doh has at last count 600 mobile dental vans and i think um, this is a great opportunity for extending care tracing tracking testing into the community especially in the face of the changing aspect of the medical and dental mission at this point um, also, you may have uh, you may have seen. Um, and, and I'm sorry. The short answer the short answer is yes. There's a protocol. It can be followed, and um, the mobile dental vans can be made infection control safe at that point. Um, but there was an article that recently posted online that was complaining about the fact that DOH had somewhere in the neighborhood of I forget how many millions or billions of medication that was just about to expire that was in inventory that they haven't been able to do anything about. And I reached out with that question to Dr. Legaspi at PGH, um, as well as one of the principal uh, physicians at the Onco Hemo Unit. And the answer was, the, the reason it's going out of expiration is we don't have supply delivery chain. We can't get it to where it needs to go. I think that would be a great piggyback project for those mobile dental vans. I think they could not only be a supply caravan, but they could also bring needed health um, to the Philippines and the outlying areas. So, and all it takes to get one is to have a barangay request it. And then at that point, the issue has been, well, we have trouble uh, manning them. And we have solutions for that if somebody would like to talk about it more. Okay, thank you for that answer, Doc. Ah. Do you? Th there's another question here. I'm back. <laughs> uh -huh. There's another question. Do you recommend changing PPE when treating patients of the same household? Yes. Who who said household bugs were the same from family member to the family member? You change PPE with 
every patient. End of story. Okay, thank you for that answer. Another question. I know some doctors, dentists are using face masks. They sterilized it using UV light. Is it okay? No, it's not sterilized. It's not disinfected. Um, no, again, put it in a microwave, wipe it down um, with a grade two um, or low level sterilant. Use a Lysol wipe on it. Um, you only get five reuses to an N95 mask. That's it. So you can't use it all day long. Um, five patients, it's out. You get another one. With a surgical three-ply, use the surgical three-ply once and throw it away. Um, but no, um, you're, you're kidding yourself, honestly, if you think UV is basically um, disinfecting properly your mask. It's not. It's not a sterilization product. The, the only thing that we've come close to is the phenolics and then the UCSF study that said, throw it in a microwave, give it a whirl. I Still, please somebody do that and see if it works here in the Philippines. So. Okay, thank you very much. Doc, there's a request here. If we could get your email address. Yes, um, and I thought I had an end slide, but it looks like the, the slide got pulled. Um, my e email, ad email address is all small caps. It's J as in John, M yes. as in Michael Cutter, C-U-T-T-E-R, yes. D-D-S, yes. okay, at gmail.com. Yes. Mm -hmm. So J M Cutter, uh, okay. DDS at gmail.com. I'm also available under John M Cutter, John Cutter, through LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. You can catch me there. And if you email me, I will definitely send you those references and you can read for yourself and, and become a uh, infection control warrior out there. So. Okay, so if there are no more questions, the, if, look, Amy, are there more questions in the chat box? Because I can see it from my end. Um, I'm just using my mobile phone. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a... Um, a follow-up question from Dr. Gemma Borromeo: Is the oral extra is the oral is the extra oral suction machine really effective? There. You mean a standalone extra oral that's not that's not attached to your airline? Yeah, it is. Um, and in the good old days, yeah, you know, um, when I practiced inside of hospitals, um, when I was first uh, out of dental school. That's principally what we used, um, especially if we were in confined spaces. There's a caveat to that. Every uh, standalone evac unit, um, if we're talking about HVE units, we're not talking about the big elephant trunk things. Um, uh, each of those has what amounts to a blood jar in it. It has an effluent container and that effluent container has to be emptied, um, usually at the end of the day um, or at lunchtime and at the end of the day. And again, you have to be careful about A, your staff who are um, involved with that process and B, where do you dump it? Um, and that's a good question. I would refer you back to the Republic Protection Act uh, and acts that are listed in the PDA interim guide to make sure that you aren't dumping infectious material into um, uh, a source that goes into the public aquifer. Uh, it needs to go into a waste stacks of some sort that is then uh, dealt with in sewage and elsewise. But uh, again, you just don't want to dump it down a sink. So at the least, it's going to go down a um, toilet. Um, and then at that point, you're going to have to disinfect the blood jar. You're going to have to disinfect the toilet. Um, so it takes some doing, but if that's all you've got and an assistant to utilize that um, contained HPE unit, they're really pretty good. They're noisy, but they're good. So. Uh, thank you very much. Are there more questions? I think I saw one from Dr. Teresita Carpio. Can you please read it, Dr. Amy? Yes, uh, what temperature in the autoclave will you recommend to sterilize N95? Or it, uh, oh my goodness, it's, it's 
manufacturer recommendation. It runs anywhere, depending on pressure, um, between 268 to 350. Um, but again, consult your manufacturer's literature at that point. Uh, Dr. Vicky? Yes? I think uh, Dr. Cutter must, might have uh, lost his connection. No, I'm still or here. They're, they're still here. No. Okay. So, are there, um, are there more questions? Dr. Amy? Um, so far, I think we've already wrapped up all the questions, Dr. Vicky. Okay. okay. So, if there are no more questions, it's now time for me to ask our participants, Dr. Cutter, I'm asking our participants two succeeding questions for a prize. Uh -huh. And this is the portion where we uh, ask and then the participants answer. And uh, for first time joiners in our webinar, we will be giving away two PPEs to those of you who will be able to answer first our question. Mm -hmm. The very first one who types the correct answer on the chat box will be declared as the winner. And the questions will be coming from the lecture of Dr. John Cutter. So let's proceed. Now here's the first question. What is the topic of Dr. Cutter's lecture today? Please type it now. <laughs> Doc Amy, you're the only one who can I I depend on. Yes. I can so. see there. <laughs> Yes, the first one to answer correctly is doc is Dr. Dominador Galan Jr. Okay, I think this webinar is being recorded, so yes. it's noted. <laughs> yes. Congratulations, Dr. Dominador. Number two question. What is the eleventh pandemic that we experienced according to Dr. Cutter? Wow, very good. But I don't know who got it first. <laughs> Dr. Amy. The first one who answered correctly is Dr. Elirut Santos Castro. Congratulations. Wow. Congratulations again for the second time, Dr. Ruth. <laughs> you you won again. <laughs> now that's it for the we ask you answer portion. Thank you for participating, participants. If there are no more questions, then we would like to say thank you, Dr. Dr. John Cutter, for giving us your time and sharing your knowledge and expertise. Right. We hope we'll be hearing again from you in our future webinars. Always again, happy to thank serve. you very much, Dr. John M. Cutter. Thank you, doctors. And uh, be safe, be well out there, and uh, enjoy being a dentist. <laughs> thank you, Doc. Thank you, ma'am. Now, before we close, I would like to call in the sponsors of this webinar to give us their messages. Oh, I think just one sponsor. For, and I would like to call back Dr. Amy De Jesus of AADS yes. and Dental Access. Thank you very much, Dr. Vicky. Thank you, Dr. John Cutter, for your um, in very, very informative lecture. First off, I'd like to commend the Schools Division Office of Quezon City and Mandaluyong City for continually encouraging and providing its division dentists quality lectures to and to its inspiring participants outside the group to join their webinars. Also, we want to give thanks to our speaker, Dr. John Cutter, for his very informative lecture today as it has brought enlightenment to our audience, bringing their practices to a more efficient and effective plane of work. Having that sound information, we are all grateful for your lecture and support to the Deaf Ed Group of Quezon City in Mandaluyong City and our company, of course, Dental Access, and as well as the AADS or the Advanced Asian Dental Summit. And this means a great deal to all attendees of your webinar. And I'm sure that they have learned and relearned new knowledge from your lecture on how to really protect themselves. Now, to give you an overview, 
overview, we started our webinar series last August 17, and now we are on our eighth leg, which only cements our goal to provide webinars that are and will be useful in the dental practice, especially in this time of pandemic. So also to our participants this afternoon, you can be rest assured that we at Dental Access, together with the SDO Quezon City and SDO Mandaluyan City, will continue to support our dentists because as we mentioned in the past, our group share the same advocacy and that is to provide continuing education to our dentists. Now, moreover, um, Dental Access is inviting hopeful and aspiring dentists or writers who wish to be part of our team. So those who have a knack for writing or has an outgoing personality and who loves to um, create a bigger network out there in the, in the dental community, uh, you can just simply send your articles or your interests to uh, media at onedentalaccess.com. Again, thank you very much for the speakers to Dr. Vicky, Dr. Charlie, and to Dr. Cutter, and to the to the winners of today's um, uh, contest or <laughs> webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Back thank to you, you Dr. Vicky. Yes, thank you so much to our resource speaker for today, Dr. John Cutler, to our sponsors, Dental Access and Advanced Asian Dental Summit, Dr. Amy De Jesus, and of course, to Dr. Charlie D. Dominguez, the brick behind our joint dental webinars. Also, thank you to all the participants who joined us today in this eighth joint dental webinar. Hope to see you soon. Uh, next time, that ends our webinar for this week. This is Dr. Vicky Bernaldez from the School Division Office of Mandaluyong. Thank you for joining us and have a good day.